All right, folks, I think we're going to get started. Uh, welcome, everybody, and thank you for coming this morning um, to yeast manipulation for increased dial efficacy in New York hops. Uh, we are going to uh, introduce our speakers and get out of the way, let these guys talk about their experiment, and then we'll have some time for questions at the end. Okay? Uh, from Omega Yeast, we have Laura Burns. Uh, here from Hop Technic, we've got Stephanie Kahn, and then Chris Holden uh, representing the hop growers of New York State. Uh, I'll turn things over to you guys. Uh, thanks everybody for coming out today. Uh, we've been doing a lot of stuff uh, to get this thing going. Uh, I want to apologize up front though, there's a little bit of data that we're missing. Uh, there's a little uh, miscommunication with the, the lab in France, which uh, we'll eventually have it. They're running the tests right now, but I think uh, what you're going to see and after you get to try, try the beer, uh, it's pretty pretty cool what we're, what we're seeing right now. Um, so we'll just do a quick overview of where this came from and why we're doing everything or why we went about doing this uh, experiment. Um, so over the last year, the hop growers of New York uh, basically went out and started asking some of the farmers, you know, what do you guys need to be more sustainable? And, uh, you know, they needed, basically they said, well, we need to be growing varieties that are sustainable. And about 90% of them came out and said that Cascade was, you know, their best yielding variety. Um, and when it came down to it, uh, economically, that was the one that made the most sense for them to continue to grow or to be doing more of. Um, now on the sales side, I know that didn't always work out for everybody, but uh, that's kind of where we came from doing this and showcasing Cascade. Um, so it's basically, we put forth, this is the, the highest yielding, most sustainable hop in New York as of right now. Uh, there's other hops on, on the rise that will probably change that, um, but there's not enough acreage in the ground yet that we know of uh, to make that happen. Uh, so last year, um, Omega Yeast released their new thialized yeast called Cosmic Punch, um, along with data suggesting that Cascade hops would work well um, because of their abundance of bound or precursor thiols. Uh, the Hop Growers of New York partnered with Industrial Arts Brewing, uh, Omega Yeast, uh, to show the differences between uh, thiol manipulating yeast or thialized yeast such as Cosmic Punch and the nine thiol manipulating yeast uh, with the British Al5, um, which is the base for the Cosmic Punch, if you guys didn't already know that. Um, we reached out to Industrial Arts, Mike and Gio. They agreed to uh, take this kind of experiment on and uh, were kind enough to brew two big batches for us um, and donate all the beer. Um, both beers would be brewed with the same malt bill and the hop formulation, uh, with the only difference being the yeast at the end of the day. Uh, the Cascade hops uh, that were used uh, were actually formulated by Hop Technic, and they were a uh, they're a true 90 true pellet. Um, so they use that we use that uh, technology as a footprint to kind of uh, uh, showcase the best of all the different terroirs that we have here in New York State to kind of uh, give you a good representation of the entire state as what Cascade can show. Um, the goals of the experiment was to, as obviously to help showcase the current most agronomically correct variety to help growers um, grow to a sustainable size. Um, we're looking to show new and innovative ways to use Cascade and uh, Cascade hot products that growers and merchants have here in New York. Uh, we're looking to showcase new and innovative yeasts like Omega, Omega's new Cosmic Punch. Um, this is to allow brewers to see um, what a thialized yeast can do with a bound precursor hop like Cascade. Um, to showcase these new and innovative techniques side by side um, with your traditional yeast that you're using for say hazy IPAs. Um, and then to explain to you guys um, how to use these new COAs and thial graphs um, and some of these new, this new technology from a testing standpoint and how you guys can use them to you know, basically make your, better, um, make your beer better. So I'll hand this over to Stephanie. Perfect. <laughs> so uh, to give you guys just a little bit of background about who Hop Technic is, we are the lab subsidiary of Virgil Gamash Farms over in Toppenish, Washington. And we've kind of cut our teeth doing harvest timing for the Amarillo brand, but then we moved on to harvest timing for other different varieties as well. And recently we moved into doing something we call the true pellet, which means that we kind of either track a hop from the time it uh, starts to flower to the time it's harvested to the time it's pelletized or in Chris's case he sent us a couple lots said hey these are the best of the best cascades that we have in New York State and we really want them to express the best of the best and we're shooting for a lemon super citrus profile and we want that to really shine so what our lab does is we take a look at the free thiols that are present in each of the constituent lots 
uh, my sensory team and I will go back and we custom blend sets of these hops into you know a series of blends and kind of weed out the ones that we say ah these are you know too tropical too red berry too you know too out of what the specs are for this case and we came up with a blend uh, that's shown there in the spider chart that is pretty pretty citrus forward it's a little tropical um, but it showcased basically the, the most uh, true to type expression of what New York Hop was looking for at the time for Cascades. Uh, and then the graph on the opposite side was actually tested by Nisios out in France and they are looking at uh, bound precursor thiols. And in this case, we see a supreme amount of one hop, in one particular, which is glutathione bound 3MH. And that is really prominent in this hop. To give you an idea, there are several hops with uh, this precursor uh, thiol, but the ones that are really stand out would be this Cascade is one of the higher ones measured. Um, and then Assad's um, would also be high in precursor, but not typical aroma hops. So something, you know, not for like a NEPA per se or not where you're going for a tropical. So um, thinking about, you know, what else there in that hop can potentially build a tropical IPA, well, very un unexpecting for that to be something like Cascade. Okay, so um, the, the recipe was kind of designed as a hazy IPA recipe. Um, and there's a lot of precursor coming from this Cascade hop. So um, when you're working with a high precursor hop, the way of hopping changes changes a little bit. Um, we found in a lot of our experiments at Omega Yeast that uh, putting hops into the mash early, um, hops with high precursor amount, especially glutathione precursors, helps to break that down so that it can be accessed by the yeast during fermentation. So strains like Cosmic Punch are converting these precursor compounds into free thiols and releasing tropical aroma during fermentation. But how do we get all the precursor we can to the yeast and, and promoting this tropical character? So um, this recipe did implement mash hopping. Um, one consideration for the amount of hops you're going to put in your mash is the amount of bitterness carryover. It's a addition before boil, so just like for first wort hopping, you're going to get some bitterness from that addition. Um, in a lot of our trials, we found about 30% of the bitterness that you'd expect from a beginning of boil addition. So it's, it's considerably less. Um, and with Cascade, you know, addition rates of a half pound to a pound per barrel will get you that like pale ale um, IBU content. So um, yeah, and then a, a small whirlpool addition and then a uh, hop back and then pretty heavy dry hop as well. Um, so looking at, uh, yeah, and the grist composition, obviously, just like focusing on some of the the adjuncts for mouthfeel and building out that like NEPA base. Um, when you look at the total hops per barrel and the different additions, uh, brew house hops totaled to 2.2. So that's the mash hop and the whirlpool, 2.2 um, pounds per barrel. And then uh, the dry hops uh, were a total of four pounds per barrel. And, you know, typical NEPA recipes, um, a lot of the time when we're trying to emphasize the thiol character in a beer, we, we try to like, kind of push a less is more um, because we found some of these late dry hop additions can, it can almost bring some of that thiol level down. And that can be your kind of your, your lever. You don't have to necessarily be modest in your hopping rate, you're still going to get a, a tropical influence. But, you know, knowing that four pounds per barrel is a really high hopping rate where thiols potentially would be um, lessened on sensory impact, but also in the beer itself. Okay, so um, the yeast used for the recipe, we've been talking about this, but like getting into a little bit of the nitty gritty. Um, so we had in a, a really like a three-year project on, on kind of understanding a little bit more about how yeast can influence style character in beer. Um, and we tried a bunch of approaches. We made beer-wine hybrids because wine yeast have been known for high beta lyse activity. Um, that kind of flumped. It wasn't really giving us anything that we could notice on sensory. 
Um, and so from there, we, we kind of had to think differently. Like, why aren't thiols being, why aren't we getting biotransformation in beer? And we found out that, you know, beer is high in nitrogen. You know, wort is like plentiful in nutrients. And it was limiting the yeast ability to transform those thiol precursors into free thiols. Um, and that was because it was silencing, that level of nutrient was silencing its, its beta lyase activity. So we used um, modern genetic editing, editing approaches, CRISPR-Cas9, to turn the yeast beta lyase on in beer fermentations. Um, so this is this new version of our, like our, I don't even know how much, we sell more of this than lager yeast. <laughs> um, but our British ale yeast um, is very, British 5 is very popular for hazy IPAs. Um, early on when NEPA recipes, you know, were, and we were starting to submit for a G, actual GABF category, um, Omega had a lot of customers, like, having a lot of success, and it was part of, it wasn't the Chicago water. <laughs> it, was, it was definitely this, this, this British 5 yeast, um, which other people sell. It's uh, Imperial Juice or um, YEAST 1318, so it's, it's out there. You're probably using it. Um, but we took that strain, which has a really nice hop balance. It's haze positive. You'll, you can come to our later talk today. I'm going to talk about haze. Um, and it also has just a, the right ester complement to hops. So already kind of perfect for this type of a style. Um, but we just try to add that next level of style note to a beer by making Cosmic Punch. Yeah, so that's, that's what Cosmic Punch is, is it's... It's everything British Five is, um, but it brings in a little added punch from punch <laughs> from thiols. Um, so, uh, industrial arts did a fantastic job. We have a fermentation curve, <laughs> uh, so it's just like like I said, it's it's the parent strain is British Five, so everything you already know about British Five, expect that to happen in your beer. Um, you know, attenuation rate. Uh, haze, all the ester profile, that's going to stay the same. Um, so, and then the terminal plato. So, even if you're getting a difference in sensory on perception for sweetness, that's not because it's a you know didn't attenuate as well. It's it's an actual like that fruitiness that you're getting. Um, so, this is so. Chris was saying we didn't get some of the data which would have given us precursor levels in the, in the wort before fermentation, but he had all the data from the hops that he shared. You guys saw there, was, there were loads of glutathione precursor in this New York Grown Cascade, insane amounts. Like, that is a, that is a lot. Um, and so then we did the analysis on the beer after fermentation, the two that you guys have right now. Um, and these are isolated measurements. We're not measuring the entire fruity profile of a beer with this technique. But what you can see, um, if you're looking at the blue bars, those are the thiol levels that were measured with British 5. And the red bars are our measurements with this new thiolized British 5. So um, the sensory threshold as well, just to give you a quick. Yeah, so the glutathione precursor maxed out. Like, we, I mean, that's that's micrograms per kilogram, um, and then the conversion of that over to the free fly thiol is, is kind of what you're seeing in this, in this finished thiol analysis. Um, so the sensory threshold of 3SH, which is the predominant one that came through in this, this um, hop itself, those sensory levels are usually around 60 uh, nanogram per liter or PPT and honestly this is why we don't know a lot about thiols is because they're so aroma impactful that you can hardly even measure them because there's so little level of thiols in the beer that make a sensory impact um, when you combine it with a lot of hops you got to kind of come through that level of intensity but thiols are extremely odor odorant compounds and you will definitely like pick them up at low PPT levels so in this context of a hoppy beer, when we're at not, now it's 11 PPB or parts per billion instead of parts per trillion, that's when we can start really noticing and emphasizing tropical character in beer. All right, so um, just briefly, a uh, little bit of what you should expect from thiol aromas. I think, well, actually, YCH has a little... Um, uh, sensory so that they, you could actually go to their booth today and smell 3SH in isolation. Um, 
but polyfunctional files are very abundant in hops, um, an indicator hop quality, but they're also found in tropical and citrus fruits, like extreme high amounts in these fruits, and that's what gives them their, their defining character. So when you're talking about passion fruit and grapefruit, those are one of the those are the highest amounts of pre or thiol compounds you'll find find in fruits, and that's why they have that aroma. Um, so yeah, if if you're also into um, wine and you love your Sauvignon Blanc, uh, you'll know when it's a thiol bomb. It's gonna scream passion fruit, grapefruit, maybe some star fruit. Um, and those re that region of the world in, in Marlborough or, or Nelson is known for these because they have raw materials like this cascade in New York, which promote a lot of thiol in the finished product. Um, yeah, so we, I guess we can just do a little uh, sensory between the two examples you have right here. So on, uh, which is the, you can. Yeah, if, you, yeah, I was gonna say, if you guys don't have a, the beers, um, Highly recommend you, if we need more, I'll go down and get them. But the uh, the one you're going to want to start with is the green the greenish can. Uh, it says right on it, New York Cascade Hazy IPA. Um, so that's the non-thialized version. And then the yellow can um, is the Cosmic Punch. And try them, and we can talk about it. Okay. Oh, you got it. I got it. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um... I think we might have some water glasses as well if anyone needs to kind of pour to get a better... Better vibe. Dieter. Need more. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I'm gonna grab some more. Just in case. I think I sold I think you did. You did perfect. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Um, I am, you know, yeah. You, I think also I'll just grab some from the water station. Okay. Do we need to grab more beer? Whoop. She, she just ran to get them real quick. We didn't know how many people were in there, so. <laughs> I've got four pieces each, and there's still more down there. She's getting one. Yeah, they're back. Yeah, she's putting them on the cart back there, because. Thank you. Yeah. I did just steal them from the water. Did, uh, from your, from your initial tape sensory on it, has it changed at all? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Mm -hmm. Kind of settled down a little bit? Yeah. yeah. It's not as, uh, yeah. potent. So we just emphasize that, too. Yeah. And, and just how it say, like, yeah. sort of on, like, literally the impact thing. Because the first time we tried it, I think we, we just got the sample, and it was a little... Really? Yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty intense. But, you know, but, you know, Sweet. What is it? It's right down there. It's right down there. March 4th. So six days. It's only six days long? Well, you guys do have to break tank. Oh, oh, right. Oh, right. That's why. Yeah. That makes more sense. Though. Yeah. No, I, it, wasn't, it wasn't finished, so it was like, it was really... That, that makes sense. So okay. And we right. thought, okay, after, you know, after it gets canned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. So, in addition. so awesome. Has everybody gotten a chance to try both of them out yet? Yes? No? Uh, Should you get some? Okay. There are some glasses on the back. <laughs> Yeah. Like not wanting to drink any beer. <laughs> you guys gotta hang in there. Come on. <laughs> I hear ya. I hear ya. I tried not to have my my extra beers last night. I was uh, extremely surprised that he wanted to crack a beer open it. <laughs>
right, so anyone want to give like a couple off their head, like for the first sample, which is more traditional, like West Coast style, or well, it's a NEPA style, but like meant to hit those West Coast, West Coast style hop notes. Anyone have any quick descriptor, descriptors for that? Billy, what do you got to say? I'll call you out. Very cool. Yeah. Um, again, it, it, you know, obviously, like, we're a yeast supplier. We're not trying to tell you to add more hops to your beer. Or, like, it's not our market. But, like, mash hopping is a thing. And it's a it's a really, like, new concept to that kind of build different aroma into the product. Um, other products out there, I know people are selling, like, those hop extracts for mainly, like, survivables with YCH covers. But, like, the, like, aroma compounds that you can add into the whirlpool to get your hot side aroma and then carry that through fermentation. Those are really successful in combination with these yeast too because it you know helps to build the complexity of the hops and not just be a one note style beer. Um, so, sure, yeah, so um, these were taken off bright tank samples like real early after fermentation. Um, maybe Chris wants to even go through them. Yeah, so um, basically on the on your left um, is the obviously the non thiolized version. So you're getting those really traditional citrus notes, orange, maybe a little bit of grapefruit there, a little bit of lemon. Um, but the orange maybe even consider a little bit of mango um, as well. Um, that's kind of where we've seen you know the New York Cascade kind of lean um, and this is to me this is a really good representation of it to be honest uh, we really like it um, and it, it's kind of like that in between as Laura was saying almost uh, like the West Coast notes but it's a hazy IPA um, so it's it's light it's refreshing um, most of us could probably drink it all day yeah and Steph what do you think yeah I mean our, our sensory team, we did, we took the, you know, samples that we got, we basically came up with the exact same notes. We got a lot of citrus, we got a lot of uh, grapefruit, some tropical notes out of um, the non thiolized beer. Um, if we actually compared it to the, the raw hop lot, we thought that was a great transference of what the aroma of the raw hop lot was and the aroma that you get off the beer is extraordinarily similar. And we were very pleased to kind of see that transference across, across mediums. Um, and then on the, uh, the thialized version, which uh, we got to try it 30 minutes ago for the first yeah. time, it was, uh, it was pretty cool to see the difference, we thought, anyways. Uh, totally different beer almost, obviously it's not, but at the same time it is. Um, and like we said, or Laura had said, some of the, this uh, the aroma characteristics and everything, um, the beer's calmed down just a little bit over the last week, um, but uh, what, the, can, the candy was three four, right? Yes. So it, it didn't take a minute, but some of that intensity from thiols can really be, you know, above kind of that threshold of okay, now we're starting to get a little bit of that sulfur that we associate with potentially um, like a rubbery or or a vinyl. Um, but just like hops come out with like loads of mercine, uh, you know, and like you're kind of waiting for that to, to level out. Um, expect a little intensity, you know, from the start. And especially you'll get, I, I, maybe anyone in here who's brewed with Cosmic Punch, um, during fermentation, you'll get like loads of passion fruit coming out of the fermenter. And as soon as you add that dry hop, you know, you're going to see that kind of drop off. So hopping rate's a good way of kind of tempering some of that style, like to get into the right, like just that right amount to boost tropical flavor. Um, a lot of these beers that we do, we're actually like with the level of styles measured in that finished beer, we're surprised that it still is as similar as, as it is to the parental strain. You're still getting like a lot of that just like known beer character you love and then from us, like 
that enhancement of, of that tropical kind of note, pushing it into more of like New Zealand hops or more, more like new, new aroma varieties. Um, yeah, we get, I, I got like, uh, you go to Wegmans, you get the, the, um, the foreign food aisles, the Goya um, sugary passion fruit. It's kind of what my first explanation of this was. That mixed kind of with uh, some pink guava, some really good pink guava. Um, but on the back end, you're getting that citrus peel, uh, the pithy, the pithy part of it. Um, my kids love to eat it. It's really weird, but uh, <laughs> I've, I've had to try it to, to to understand what they got going on. And then it's also I get kind of like a personally I get kind of like the cashmere, that that dankness out of like what cashmere can do. Um, and maybe there's a correlation there that we'll discover someday. Mm -hmm. um, being that cashmere is a daughter of Cascade, but that uh, that's kind of there on the back end, just kind of lingers in the back of your throat. What do you guys think? Good. Yeah. <laughs> Both of them are great, right? Yeah, it's good. Yeah. It, I think the the big thing here is like you know, for us, you know, strains like Cosmic Punch may not make or break. Like you might just want something a little more nuanced on an IPA that pushes it more tropical, and like yes, that is going to be what you're going to get out of Cosmic Punch. And I think using hops like this New York Grown Cascade only help edge your, you know, like that aroma intensity you're going to get in the finished beer. Um, one of the, you know, I, I, I kind of like, you know, my heart, I want to see this build into a style that's really unique and, and something very different because in isolation, these styles are just off the charts. And I love Sauvignon Blanc. Like I am a, I'm a big fan of passion fruit. Um, but without those heavy hopping rates, you know, you push styles and it's just an, an intense like style beer. Um, and doing a mash hop pale ale or mash hop blonde or mash hop lager, it's all isolated styles and it's through the roof and it's exciting. Um, so you can play with this idea of, you know, sourcing local ingredients, keeping your costs down, making sure you're, you know, you feel your relationships with your farmers and build this entirely like kind of just different concept. Um, and I think that, you know, if you think about what thiols are, like people talk about them in wine all the time, and it's this emphasis on terroir, like what are you doing? Like you're sourcing local ingredients, you're building your local terroir. This is another idea of like beer that we just might need to explore a little bit and not think, I just need to push a hoppy, I, like Nipah style. Um, there's more to do with it, and, and these local ingredients are, are really giving us that variety. And it's really exciting. Steph, what was your what was your initial thoughts on? So the samples that we got um, had the same same notes as this. So we tasted it very fresh. It hadn't even been fully canned yet, and the thiols were super intense. Uh, I think I kind of got a weird face from one of my colleagues a little bit. Um, <laughs> her her beer for Science Friday was questionable that day. Um, but now that the, the thialized uh, beer has calmed down a bit, you get a lot of that brilliant passion fruit, a lot of papaya, a lot of guava, very tropical aromas that you're expecting out of that 3MH or the 3SH, depending on your terminology. I go um, with IUPAC and nomenclature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very I'm, nerdy. I'm a, I'm a basement chemist. We, we just roll with the old version. So... Um, but I think it's brilliant that you can you can have such different expressions of a beer from a very similar starting material, and to get this you know great passion fruit and tropical expression, but at the same time you can still have your you know brilliant citrus kind of more West Coast, you know Washington Idaho Oregon kind of mirror citrus. Pond. Yeah, yeah. Give me some mirror pond. Mm -hmm. This doesn't taste 100% Cascade. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I've been messing around with the cost of production. We also, at our farm, we grow a brewer's bowl, which is kind of what we're used to anymore. But it's a huge can of Dream Bomb. It's like high end, and then it's cool, and Durango uh, also. It's like just seeing how that gets even evolving with just using cost of production, or even even, I just need to say, the wallet, and you know, someone's run design. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have a well. Lance is the owner of Omega with uh, Mark, but his brother grows hops in Indiana, and he does a ton of triple pearl. And we use a lot of that in our experiments because it's also pretty high in precursor. So these public variety hops, yeah, you you got some options. There's definitely, yeah, nugget, yep, yeah. Uh, Calypso has been uh, another one that in the literature is popping up, and we use that. And we get, yeah, mm-hmm. middle fruit guys. Who, who knew? <laughs> yeah. We don't have any more slides. Yeah. Okay, no more slides. So I guess we should open this up to more questions rather than, you know, just random people chipping in. So I'm sure you guys have lots of questions. I know I do. Um, anybody? Yes, please. It's in the literature, and I can send you those papers that give like the actual quantification. With this paper, this this result right here, that's obviously not published, but the amounts that they're seeing in this cascade measures at that high level of what has been measured in hops. So um, not a lot of hops have been measured. So I think that's something that people are looking to do. Yes. Uh, so long story short, we do see differences between crop years, um, especially if you take the years that shall not be named 2020, 2021, you're going to see a lot of differences because of the weather that you experience. So out here, you guys were really wet uh, last year, a lot of rain, um, you know, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, you have fires, you have heat, you have, you know, plant stressors as far as mildews and pests. That's going to um, trigger different responses in the plant that's going to generate different uh, response pathways that may or may not generate these pre-bound thiols. Um, so that kind of is going to be an effect, but you guys are good growers and you know, you know, you know your plants, so you're going to have a relationship with your grower to say, you know, hey, kind of what's the crop you're looking like for you guys? Um, and then there are options too that there's other labs who will be help test your hops uh, after harvest and even during harvest to kind of help measure consistency. Yeah, and the precursor levels, um, when they are reported in the literature, often there are multiple lots of multiple lots or growing regions of the same variety, and it's trending on that variety for precursor. Um, yeah, it's influenced by agricultural practices, growing region, et cetera. It's terroir. That's what it is. Um, but you know, the data shows that really with like, so early harvesting on hops, you have high precursor. You start to mature that hop cone and it starts to convert to free thiol. So harvest window is really important as well. Um, but you know, not, not a lot of us will have luxuries of, of picking our harvest window or a lot, but there are definitely like very clear um, correlations to variety and precursor amounts. They're extremely stable. Um, a lot of the aroma compounds that um, we seek out are really prone to oxidation, et cetera, and very volatile. Um, these are, they're, they're, even in the beer, they're, they're soluble, they're non-volatile. They're, they stick around through the entire boil. Actually, there's evidence that some of the precursor increase during the boil, which maybe you're concentrating your wort, I don't know. But um, it's, they're so, super stable. A few labs in the world to do that right now, but I think people are are interested, and I think, um, yeah, it's like three hundred. It's like three hundred dollars a sample to get that information, um, but that's you know that's valuable to the brewer. It's valuable to the supplier, and I think you know these things will maybe be more of a COA, just like Chris is talking about. And to tag team on that, like, don't be afraid of your older varieties, or your older crop year um, lots, because honestly, as long as they're stored, and we found that. As long as they're stored cold under, you know, 28 degrees Fahrenheit or below, and they're in a flush sealed nitrogen container, you're going to have at least 
five years of good storage on an older crop year. So if you're looking at anything from, say, you know, 2021 to 2016, and if they're stored well, the quality should still be there, especially in the aromatics. You might have a slight decrease in, um, in your alphas, but as far as the aromatics go, they should be solid. Yeah, um, and that was like a lot of our early days in, in uncovering like kind of how to coax it out of the yeast because initially, you know, we took some traditional approaches in making beer yeast hybrids with wine yeast type, you know, trying to build the biotransformation activities of wine yeast into beer yeast, um, and that was not successful. So it's not a, it, for us, we had to learn that you know, your matrix of beer is very different from your matrix of wine, and so how yeast act and fermentation changes. And um, the main pathway for the biotransformation of thiols is, is in the IRC7 gene, which is turned off in beer fermentations. Very small amounts approaching sensory levels could be seen in lagers, but that's gonna be, again, like masked by a lot of the other qualities of that beer um, that might just like make it not as noticeable. But when I started drinking the first experiments, which were like, barely noticeable that we were doing. I was like, wow, I'm getting this it's like super like sharp grapefruit note that I like associate with lagers. I love this. And yeah, maybe there is something to like some of the lager yeast or some of like our, when we coax them out the right way where you can start to see some of this from the yeast in beer, but in a NEPA recipe, you'll never get anything that's approaching sensory with a traditional strain. Um, but we just activated IRC7 in fermentation. So the um, CRISPR-Cas9 is like kind of how we went in very specifically to edit that, but we took the promoter region of IRC7 and changed it from being repest in beer to an active promoter from another gene and just made it expressed in beer. Yeah. What is IRC7? It's a beta lyase enzyme. So it's, it's, yeah, so it's part of the natural like process of yeast responding let's, to... Let's assume I know almost nothing about science whatsoever. Yeah. <laughs> so an enzyme. I mean, like, eventually someday maybe we'll have one of these just throw in beer you don't need yeast for or whatever. Um, we have enzymes for a lot of things, right? Um, so the beta lyase enzyme is it's cleaving the bond between, which like we, Chris covered, but the precursor compounds are bound to cysteine and glutathione. Um, that molecule is amino acid bonded to the sulfur of the thiol group, and the beta lyase cleaves that carbon sulfur bond. So it's just bringing a, like a inert flavor potential of a of an ingredient and cleaving off that amino acid residue and producing the aroma like active form of that compound. Um, you know what, there's, there's definitely interplay, like this, this gene IRC7 is meant to acquire like sulfur from the environment, so when nutrients are limited, like you might see, and, and similar to wine, you might see a little bit of H2S creep up, but the process of fermenting and getting through to the finished product, it's, if it did come up, it'll be like not at sensory threshold by the end, and in wine, they actually push H2S because it's an antioxidant and it protects those styles in the finished product. So they'll make a super reductive fermentation and blend it to their main fermentation to preserve these compounds. So you may notice a little bit of something coming through, but it's not, it's not a bad thing in the beer and it will definitely condition. We assume that it's a, an effect of the barley enzymes themselves, so like the mash would be the best place for them, but we've had people do first wort hopping and said it was amazing. Um, so maybe part of the boil helps as well, but you know, with what we've done, um, you know, in, in our measurements, like what Chris had on the amounts of the different versions of these precursor compounds, we were shifting from a glutathione precursor to a cysteine precursor with mash hopping, and that's what, like, that was what we were aiming for. So the yeast was, like, able to take it up and, and biotransform it. Um, 
Um, it's like in, and what Molly is saying is like first war hopping in like early hop editions, the idea was to like kind of incorporate a soft bitterness and build aroma from an early edition. Maybe we've discovered this again. Like maybe we're not finding out anything new and people knew this from the start, but no one's making use of those practices anymore. Um, yeah. And, and um, yeah, I think with the, the mash hopping, like, I think the major thing is just to be mindful of bitterness. Just like, you know, your first war hopping, you're going to get some carryover of bitterness. Um, and, yeah, it's it's been cool. The other ideas of mash hopping are that, you know, there's, there's compounds in the hops themselves that are removed through the water. So the polyphenols, the heavy metals. And these are really bad on finished beer stability. So maybe that's why thiols are coming through so much better in these beers, because you're taking some of those parts of the hop that lessen stability in the finished product. And then I hear earlier you said that um, your perception was about 30% of the bitterness was coming through as opposed to like a boil start addition. Yeah, our measured IBUs. Um, like calculated what you'd anticipate expected IBUs, we get about 30% of that as what you would measure or calculate from a beginning of boil addition. So yeah, if you add the same amount in the kettle, you might get 60 IBUs and then in the, um, in the mash hop, you'd be around 20. The malt? Yeah. That's, that's what we're missing. <laughs> I, I love, that's the terroir again. Like we can think about this in malt too. So we're actually working with some of the malt suppliers um, to just kind of build this concept of um, that the barley variety, but also is it spring or is it winter? Are we growing it in this region or are we growing it 800 miles away? Are we suffering from droughts or are we, are we okay? Um, so, you know, that terroir of bar barley will come in as well. And um, I think this beer came through really well because of the addition of the, of the Cascade hops. Like, they helped to build that precursor kind of pool for this yeast to release during fermentation. But malt alone, if you just brewed it without any hops, would, ha would be passion fruit-like. So um, the malt is carrying a lot of that precursor as well. Yeah, I, honestly, like the when you're saying lots of lots of thiols, um, uh, those lager trials are measuring 50 ppt, which is just under sensory threshold, and they do a conversion calculation instead of reporting on the actual thiol concentration in the finished beer, because, like, it's barely getting to the amount that you want um, to be able to perceive it on sensory. And if you're putting hops in it, forget it. You're not going to build any sensory off of that. So, yes, I, I love cooler temperatures for these beers because CO2, nucleation, kind of blow off, volatiles, like that all drives this stuff out in fermentation. Um, and we have various lager strains we've built as well, um, and many breweries have tried. So um, we're hoping to have other ideas out there, you know, West Coast style um, yeast and, and things that can kind of build this in other, in other avenues. Yes. Those are my favorite loggers. <laughs> yeah, they, they are just like, they are screaming with passion fruit. So it's actually really not a logger anymore. Um, you got to think about like what you want out of this. Um, IPA, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, they're, they're different. I, I gravitate towards them. They're unique. If you want to think about like, would you ever brew a blonde in your life again? Maybe, like not many people want to put a blonde on the recipe like on their tap list because it's just going to take those, you know, those early adopters to beer, they're getting an entry point, but like people want flavor. Um, so brewing a blonde with these yeast builds like completely different beer and it's the same material cost and the same process and the same everything. So, um, yeah, it's interesting to just, maybe you don't even want to call it a blonde, but figure it out. Um, like marketing is a lot of this. Uh, if you, if you led with, a mash hop blonde, 
people will think, what the fuck is this? And I don't care. Like, I don't, I'm not, if I were coming to a bar, I'd be like, that sounds bizarre. Um, but, you know, brewers will start to gravitate towards that. You just probably need to figure out a good way to market it. So initially, mash hopping was supposed to improve water ability. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so like depending on your hopping rate and all, and actually you'd, you'd expect to have an increase in pH, um, you know, you do when you dry hop. It's def you are measuring stuff, which is really important. I don't know the answer. Um, but I think you have, you know, the right approach to just knowing how mash hopping impacts the process and getting your, your process dialed in. I know when I started making NEPAs, I was like, Ah, turn down the agitator. <laughs> you know, so you're going to figure this stuff out. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah, I think the problem on some of our initial launches, we didn't make some of, like our early lager strain, we had it in um, 3470, and I think most brewers know that's one of the more sulfury lagers. Um, so a lot of, like how that interplays with hops was bringing in, and kind of introducing a lot of confusion on what thiols were doing, because it was pushing more sulfur in the beer um, innately. Um, so, I, I, like craft beer brewing professionals, I don't know what it is. Some Facebook, yeah, Facebook groups. Um, I followed those trends and, and like looked into that stuff too. And most of the people responding about Cosmic Punch specifically were giving really positive feedback, and the negatives were coming from that early lageries. Yeah. Pitching rate. We did pitching rate trials and just kind of like with experiments in haze and thiols and, and nothing was like a very dramatic difference. So, you know, I don't want to complicate it for you and just give you like, it's not, under pitching will not produce thiols. It's not, it's not like esters. Um, you know, you're converting the precursor from wort and that isn't really changing with an under pitch. Under pitching for esters is like pushing like the stress growth phase of yeast and making esters go over over normal levels. Yeah. Well, one, really, I don't have an explanation other than the recipe itself. Like, with this cascade and different malt types, um, we find barley malt has loads more than wheat and oats. So these things make a difference. Um, so if that recipe changes, like, the output of files is going to also change. Yeah, that's maybe that's Chris's stick right here. Um, and then, yeah, and the hopping practices again, if like, your dry hop timing and the hop dose, like in the on the cold side, that all really has for us made the biggest difference. We've seen a massive like sensory impact of hopping when like, you're going for thiols. Sometimes you can really, like, you need to have a good balance um, to really achieve your goal. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I actually prefer the late editions, but yeah, and, and our data. That makes a question for you, Chris. Um, so we know that we're, what we're saying is that from year to year, these levels can change, and we're talking about your cascades in particular. Should we be concerned about 
farm to farm in a given crop year? Absolutely. So this particular cascade, like like um, like Stefan said earlier, this was designed to take hops from the entire state or the, the, the major growing regions of New York to exemplify what New York can do as a whole. And the main reason being is, you know, on the spot market, you guys are seeing these differences because you get something from Idaho, you get something from Michigan, you get something from New York, you something, you know, you, you don't know necessarily unless you're out there contracting this and selecting yourselves. Um, if this was actually, I'm gonna- So this was a blend? Yeah, I'm gonna show you. Um, it's actually the part I wanted in the present. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> It's good stuff. Like the, the science behind making this blend is, you know, exciting. Thinking about that we can achieve some better quality out of what we're that. looking for, out of variability in the agricultural side is really cool. Um, I don't have it pulled up anymore, of course. Um, so anyways, uh, the, the lots that went into this, if I, if I could show you that really quick, um, and, and Steph can help out with this. What you can see with certain varieties, you've got oh, it's, it's herbal, and then this one over here is really melony, and then this one over here is tropical, and then all of a sudden you get the blend together, and it's like, holy crap, here's a bunch of citrus. And it's insane what some of this, these blending techniques can do, and it comes down to some of the style footprinting that Hoptechnic's doing. And the, 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 the particular farms that went into this, this batch itself, um, I think that people came in that year and selected from each one of those farms and the particular batches they came from as singularity blends. Um, and then we blended this one together. And I know that some of the people that have used or contracted uh, the, the single farm stuff, they also have used this and they like both. Now, was it a combo of, you know, the different farms being also in this as well? It could be, I don't know. But the difference between what we see even um, from central New York to the southern tier to Lake Ontario to western New York, it's, it's major. Uh, what you can see in Washington even, you can drive five miles from, you know, five miles down the road to a different farm and you see differences. So what it really comes down to is making sure that each, you know, what you guys are using for your hops, selection is huge. Um, if you're asking about getting the thial testing done, I mean, obviously it's, it can be done. Um, but it's expensive too. So I think at the end of the day, it's gonna be a lot of trial and error um, from each one of your guys' breweries, unless you're contracting boatloads of it, obviously, uh, to make sure that what you're doing year after year is, is as close as you can replicate. Um, the only other way to do that is you talk to the, the scientists that are testing the stuff day after day and uh, to make sure that they're, what you're seeing on your thial footprints, what you're seeing for the um, your total oils, what you're seeing for sensory analysis is the same year after year, because it does change. It changes on the farm. Um, what we saw mm -hmm. in 2020, the New York uh, crop in 2020 was amazing. Uh, we saw some of the best cascades that we've ever seen. This is a 2020 lot. Um, 2021, we saw some, it was weird. Uh, in 2021, some of the stuff from, that was like the standouts were kind of, I wouldn't say bottom of the barrel in 2020, but they weren't the ones that people were coming in and raving about is basically what it came down to. And that changes year to year, weathers, you know, weather patterns, everything else. Uh, I've gone to Washington the last three years. Uh, two years ago, you went to Toppenish and you could actually see the sun. Uh, you were up in Yakima or Moxie, you couldn't, you didn't see the sun. You could, it was like driving here yesterday. It was insane. Um, <laughs> But, you know, it, and, and then two weeks later after that, it's, it's all cleared out and it's good to go. So that, you know, obviously variety, uh, the varieties that are picked in those different time frames are also subjective to that, you know. Um, so the biggest thing I can say is you need to be talking with the farmers. And, and again, it comes down to the reason why we use Cascade was the fact that it's the most successful hop in New York. If you've got issues early on, Cascade can be harvested farther farther back you know we've got guys that are harvesting at uh august 23rd we got guys that are harvesting september september 23rd and as of right now i don't think there's any other hop grown in new york that can do that so it really helps out when it comes down to like if you guys want something early or you want something late um it helps out or if you're looking for a hop for this beer or a hop for this beer you know what i'm saying so it just uh it's it's very crucial and uh, we do 90% of our stuff by sensory, and we send the good stuff out for actual data. 
um, your noses are gonna tell you what's right. Uh, you won't maybe know going into the recipe, but you know, make sure that you pay attention to, you know, building that sensory aspect of your quality and just giving yourself like confidence in the approach because it's a big deal. For sensory, for us, like we save a lot of money just running through some, some sensory trials first. All right, last question, Peter. So the test, the test for the hops and all the beers, each, each sample, so there's uh, uh, five samples, each one's about $300. So you've got to, obviously if you're a brewer or even you're working with a merchant or a grower, you've got to kind of work that into your cost if they can do it or if you can do it and make sense of it basically. Um, and there's most likely um, in the next year or two, you'll probably start seeing, instead of just total oil, you start seeing the total thiol composition, or the, uh, not the composition, but the weight of the thiols in there, um, based off from what Omega's doing uh, with stuff like Cosmic Fudge. Also, we want to say thank you so much to Industrial Arts for yes. making this beer and giving this example. Let's all thank our speakers, please. And uh, in the interest of being interested in being good attendees, uh, please take your cans with you or let's leave them in the stack at the back of the room maybe if you didn't finish them off so we're not leaving beer all over the place. So thank you guys very much. Round of applause for our speakers, please. That was a really cool talk. Well, I knew I was going to.